Wouldn't it be great to have that song on each morning? Just kind of go, yeah, I'm ready to go. Let's go. We can do this. In this one and only day, in my one and only life, do I want to look at fear or do I want to shine a light? A few weeks ago, I shared that with you. Some of you have heard it before from Juliet Funk. But it's a choice each day, right? Isn't that so great that God has given us this free will, we believe, to choose? That each day we get up, we have a choice on that specific thing. We can choose fear. We can be paralyzed. Or we can choose to be the light. There ain't nothing about that easy. I'm not coming here today to tell you that's easy. But what I do want to encourage you, it's a choice. If you ever want an invitation to something and I mean, invitations nowadays come in various ways, right? I mean, used to, I mean, you might get it in the mail. Uh, of course, face-to-face is a good way to get an invitation to go do something. But now there's, there's the evites, there's somebody just texts you, and it could be all kinds of different things from small things to, hey, uh, do you want to just come over for dinner, which could be a big thing or a small thing, to going on a trip or a vacation or inviting you to come and hear about something that, you know, a, a business opportunity. But an invite comes in all kinds of different ways, and sometimes you get that invite. <clears throat> now, nowadays, uh, our invites often, which wasn't the case used to as much, you get an invite and you go, well, I'll let you know because you just want to see if something better comes along. So you may have to opt out, right? So you just kind of hang on to it. What if something better comes along? Sometimes you get that invite, and you get there and go, that wasn't worth my time. You ever been to one of those? That was not worth the effort. Sometimes you get there and go, man, what if I'd have missed this? What if I'd excused it? I just said, you know what, I got something else going on, like, watching the Razorbacks get beat by Liberty or something like that. I got an invite years ago by friends here at the church. Some of you know them, but they invited us to Skagit County, Washington, northwest part of Washington, to the Tulip Festival. Now, I'll be honest with you. It was not on my man list. Now, you can take that for what it's worth. You go, you got a man list? I didn't know there was such a thing. Well, I'm just telling you. It wasn't something I would look down at the end of my bucket list to go, hey, I did that. I went to the Tulip Festival, man. I took a risk. <laughs> but I got there. I don't know if we got any pictures of it, but I was blown away. I was actually, it was kind of a, it was a little blurry there, but I, I was blown away. It almost doesn't look real. It's unbelievable. How many have ever been to it? And, you know, there's a few, and I know there's a few of you have been to the Tulip Festival in this room. It's unbelievable. And you just kind of just, it's acres and acres and acres and acres. And it's not just the beauty, because what's the reality? We talk about it all the time here. A farmer plants a seed, but there's one thing he can't make it do, right? He can cultivate it. He can water it. He can pick the right time to seed. He can do all these. But one thing he can't make it do is what? He can't make it grow. Those people toil. You look at those rows and you look at all that and go, this is not only just beauty, somebody really worked this. It didn't just happen. Now, yeah, you got to be in a certain part of the world to have that weather and all the things that go with it. I get it. But an invitation that I was blown away by. And I would encourage you, you ever get a chance to go, I think it's in March, April, If you ever get a chance to go to it, I encourage you to do it. If you're in that part of the country at that time. But in John chapter 1, there's an invitation. And John the baptizer has been, you know, he's been doing his deal. And he's got, and John the baptizer has what? Disciples himself, right? He's got people who are following after him. Eventually he will say, I need to diminish. Christ needs to increase. I need to get out of the way He needs to become bigger. But in this setting, he's there, 
And here comes Jesus. And it's kind of where we pick it up. The next day, next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. I don't even think that's what he, it's an exclamation point. Look, the Lamb of God. I don't know exactly, but if you put an exclamation point, it's probably like more energy behind it. I'm not sure John put that there. You know what I'm saying. But when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Now, they're the disciples of who? John. But when they hear this, what happens? They follow Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? We're not even going to preach on that today, but that's a, that's a sermon. They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. Come and see. We did a sermon series years ago on that. We're not going to do that today. But so they went and saw. Remember we talked about it a few weeks ago. Jesus went, he saw, and he had what? Compassion. They went, and they didn't just see Jesus. They went and saw Jesus. They went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon's, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him, and you're Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas, which meant Peter. We have found the Messiah. I found the Messiah. You've got to come and see, man. You've got to come. What an invitation. Probably maybe the greatest invitation you will ever get. But in this moment, John, John I, I want to back up with John here going, John said, because the NIV that I read here says, look, but other translations say, behold. That's even bigger, honestly. Behold, the Lamb of God. And as I read this and, I, and another comment, they said, there's not one of these three, John, Andrew, Philip, which we're not talking about here, there's not one of these three that doubt what he just said. There is something when you meet Jesus and you're open and you're looking for Jesus for sure and you're open when you meet Jesus, there's no doubt. And the first thing you want to do when that happens is, is invite. I don't know how you get around it. When you're in a moment, and especially with your other people, where there's this John's calling it out, but, but, but there's that connection where, where I hear John, if I'm John the baptizer saying this, and I'm Andrew or Philip, when I hear that, there is something deep speaking to deep. Something speaking more than just what I'm hearing in my ears at this moment. Something is going deeper than just, hey, a casual conversation. Deep came to deep. Speaking to a place we often don't go. I hope you have an opportunity in your life to be connected at some point, whether you have or not, when, there's, when you meet someone maybe for the first time and you just all of a sudden there is this deep speaking to deep. I've shared about Brother Paul Holder for the first time I ever met him. There was deep speaking to deep. Wouldn't it be awesome to be a person that walked this earth when people spoke to you and they were looking and they were open, they were hungry. There was deep speaking to deep. 
Small talk gets blown out. The shallows gets kicked to the side. The Midlands, we go past it, we go to the deep. As John Eldridge would say, the shallows, Midlands, and depths, the deep. Many years ago, I got an invitation we did as a church at Crossroads. I had met with a lady named Roxanne Alexander uh, who worked in the former CIS or the former Soviet Union, Confederate Independent States. That's what it was called. I guess may still, I don't know if it's still called that now. There's a lot going on, right? <laughs> That's what they called it then. And I asked her. She, was, she lived in Ukraine. She lived in Kiev. Uh, worked with the Skinners who lived in Moscow, who oversaw that. And Carla now is one of our general superintendents. And as I met with her, I asked her, because we were, we were, God had laid on our heart that we were supposed to go partner with the world area. But we didn't know where. But we knew that part. So we were praying and we were asking. And somebody said, what about the Ukraine? Well, we sent a medical team to the Ukraine. I, I did not go, but I thought that's not it. Even though, you know, I just, I just knew it. I don't know why I knew it. You know, sometimes you know what it's not. You're just not sure what it is. So I just knew it wasn't. And then nothing wrong with the Ukraine and, and then or now, either one. Well, there's a lot going on, obviously, right? I hope you're praying for all that. But I sat with her and I asked her. I said, Roxanne and, and Ryan Womack, and I sat with her and asked her the question, where is there one place in the former or, or in the CIS that nobody's going to? I mean, people were going to the Ukraine. People were going to Georgia, I think. People were going to different places, the part of that confederate. But, but she said, well, that's easy, Armenia. And I won't go into all the story about what that meant when I heard her say that. Because I didn't even know Armenia was a part of it. <laughs> It's former Soviet Union. And it's the southernmost part. It's, it's, it's bordered by Turkey, Iran, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. It's got an open border with Iran. But it was the only one that Russia allowed to stay Christian. Okay, they could still worship there. And there's a lot goes into that. And I won't get into all those details. But here's my deal with it, though. I knew in that moment something was speaking to my deep we went on a pre-trip, and I met Pastor Karin, and I won't go into all of this. I could tell you, I could spend a whole sermon, Dr. Dan and I, we could spend a whole sermons talking about just him. But the moment I met him, I knew deep, spoke to deep, and I barely, he speaks like four languages, I, I barely speak one. And there was something when I met Pastor Karin, and, and it was that deep speaking to deep. And I knew that God was calling us, and we took, uh, that, uh, show the slide of Armenian so you kind of know uh, uh, Armenia, and I won't go, you can read that kind of on the side there, but that's Mount Ararat there where Noah's Ark supposed to, to, to supposedly is where that is. Okay, it's on Mount Ararat. It looms over, uh, over uh, Yerevan, the capital. It's like this huge shadow. This kind of, you, you, wherever you are, you see it. And we, we went north, though, to Gumri. That's where we spent weeks. And Dr. Dan's been there multiple times. My kids and some of you in this room may have already been there with us. But I knew God called us, and, and, and days before, like a, a few weeks, 10 days or so before, we were supposed to take 25 to 30 teens. Go ahead and slip over to that other picture. And we took all of our teens and my, all my kids, all four of my kids, Jan and I went, and took all this big team, and it was awesome. But 10 days beforehand, I'm there in my bedroom. I wake up, and there was this fear that gripped me, just gripped me. Like I could not shake it. Going, what are you doing? Because we hadn't opened. At that time, 2004, uh, Americans were getting captured, getting beheaded. And because we had an open border with Iran, I started having all these things start playing out in my head. That what if we're captured? What if, we're, what if we take our, my ki our kids? As a matter of fact, what if they take somebody else's kid? What if they take my kid? Who, what do you do with that? And so I almost canceled it. Fear. This one and only day of my one and only life. Do I choose fear or do I choose to shine a light? I didn't know that saying at the time, but I was out running. That's back when I, my, my old body could handle the running part of it. And I was out running, and it just felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to my deep. Go, what if they did capture you? Would you still praise me? Yes, I will. Now, I didn't tell all those parents that I was about to take their kids. I was battling with all this, okay? <laughs> they probably all pulled out. But this one and only day, and this one and only life, 
We had an invitation. That invitation spoke to our deep. That invitation was to choose fear or to choose to shine a light. And as we are concluding in some ways, if you want to call it that, our mercy series, that's a huge question for us. In this one and only day of our one and only life, what will I choose? What I love about this passage of Scripture here in John, when they heard it and heard John, they got it. They didn't say, hey, let's go call a committee meeting. Let's go think about it for two weeks. They didn't say, I'll pray about it. Make it spiritual. I don't think they prayed the sinner's prayer. I don't see it anywhere in there. Do you know you can come to Jesus in all kinds of different ways without having to pray the sinner's prayer? So in this room, we could go around and go, how many different ways have you come to know Jesus? You've come to know Jesus, but how many different ways did that happen? It's crazy. It can happen at an exit ramp, an on-ramp, at an interstate. Personally, I know that. Sometimes we have this fear, right, of inviting someone or we have this fear of speaking to someone about Jesus because part of that fear, I'm guessing, is because I may not know all the answers. So if I ask them, if I want to start a conversation with somebody, they may be more loaded. They have, may make more answers and questions than I have in my whatever. I'm, I'm acting like I got a gun here. I don't know why I'm acting like that. Okay. They may have more things loaded up in there to fire off than I do. If you read anything about Peter, Peter asked, liked to ask a lot of questions, didn't he? It, Peter liked to fire off before, I mean, again, you know, what was it? Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, fire, and I've started to say it right. Peter liked to speak before he thought. So if you're Andrew, you already know this, but still, what do you do? Because you're convicted and you're compelled, what do you go do? You go invite him anyway and say this. You don't just say, hey, I think maybe. No, we found the Messiah. But often, what if Andrew goes, I'm just going to keep this to myself. What do we do with part of this Bible? What do we do on Pentecost? And going, you know what, I, Peter never would. Yeah, Peter's such a, you know, he's such a hothead. But what if he asks me questions? What if somebody, my, 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 my spouse, or what if, what if it's my, my family member, what if it's somebody, you know, that, that, that my, 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 my person that I work with, and make sure you're always not getting yourself in trouble in certain things. I, I, you know, I just want to put that out there as a disclaimer so you can't blame it on me. What if they've been waiting? Not with someone like the pastor who's so elegant like me, and articulate. No, you know what I'm saying. What if they're waiting on just somebody who doesn't know all the answers, but there's been a change? See, I think you've got to be careful. Oh, I go to church tonight. That's not enough change. Let me say it again. Just going to church is not enough change for people. Oh, now you go to church and you give a little bit of money. Oh, wow, you've changed. No, it is a transformation. You know what we have as a vision here at Renovation Church? We actually have a vision to raise up influencers through spiritual transformation to be salt and light where you're already engaged and influential, where God's already planted you. Eventually, we want you to minister in the church because we need volunteers. We eventually want to be all out in the community. But where God puts you, just like Andrew, first place you go, you go to the people you know the best. That's your first circle. That's your first place. But what if they ask me? I thought Josiah was going to blow up my sermon for this week, last week, and he started preaching out of John chapter 9. I'm going, man, I've been reading on that thing. I've got to get another sermon. <laughs> Fortunately, he just stayed on the front side of it, right? But no, John 9, 25. They're quizzing him. Their religious leaders are quizzing him and quizzing him and quizzing him and quizzing him. And he goes, you know, I don't know if he's a sinner. I don't know who this Jesus is. In other words, what I'm saying is I don't even know 
I don't know all the theological. I don't know all the historical. But what I do know is I was once blind and now I see. That's what I know. What I do know is I am convicted and compelled to tell people about the one, the one. That's what I know. I don't know all the other answers. But I bet you I know somebody who might. So I bet you that question's been asked somewhere in the last 2,000 years. So if you'll give me a chance and you really want to journey with me on this particular question, because a lot of times people are asking you a question because they don't want to journey with you. They just want to stop you, right? But if you really want to know the answer to this question, I don't know it, but let's try to figure it out together. That's a great question. But I know this. I was once blind. And now I see. You know, there's not many books in the Bible written about Andrew. Matter of fact, I don't know if there's any. He's not mentioned that many times, but every time, almost every time he's mentioned, the time, a few times he's mentioned, he's inviting people, little boy. Andrew the inviter. What if he hadn't invited Peter? What, what if he had been concerned? Well, if Peter becomes to know Jesus, he might be the guy. He might get books written about him. He might be the dude at Pentecost, even though they didn't know what that was at the time. He might be the dude standing up front going, we're going here. Andrew didn't care. He didn't care. Aren't you glad John the baptizer taught his disciples well? I got to diminish. What if your biggest role in life was pointing people to the one, and what if they did have books written about them, and it's not about having books written about you. You know I'm not saying that. Don't hear what I'm not saying. But what if they're one step away? One invite away. Just one. I've said it before. People don't need to meet 50 full-blown followers of Jesus Christ. Just one would help. (laughs) Who's convicted and compelled and the anointing and the fragrance and the aroma of Christ is coming off their life. Where when you show up, something deep within them is stirred because of where you are with him. Andrew, the inviter. So today, we're going to invite you to a few things. Once dinner on the grounds. It's going to be easy to walk out of here, get in your car, and leave. I'm not going to pressure you. But somebody... At dinner on the grounds, may need to set the table with you. Somebody at dinner on the grounds or at IGN groups may need to sit across the circle from you. And let me say this about IGN groups. I know two days from now this is political. I mean, we're, we're doing elections. Let me just do, give a real quick deal on this. Do not, do not mention anything about that in your circle. You do not want me knocking on your door. (laughs) That's not what this is for. Things are age appropriate. The reason why we do IGNs is so we can, we don't want to just be multi-generational here at Renovation. We want to be intergenerational. And that's a difference. That means you've got to put on your big boy pants and big girl pants and act like adults. So be smart. Or I may be knocking on your door. They're awesome. And those who engage them know it, as long as we're smart about it. But the bigger invite today, you're going to go to IGN. We're going to go to dinner on the grounds, chicken spaghetti, baked ziti. I'm telling you, you want to be here. (laughs) But you're going to be invited over to some tables. But tables are inanimate objects, and we don't really try to build a relationship with tables. But the people behind them, we do. And why they're there, we do. So today at Dog, 
And I'm going to read this because I did such a good job writing it down. <laughs> you may not be the one counseling someone in child help. <clears throat> you may not be the one working at Titus House and being a part of the, helping with recovery. You may not be the one that just got called to do foster care or work with refugees or mentor teens in the schools. You may, you may support our veterans by filling the green bags, but never meet one of those at Victory Place. You may not be here on Friday nights late night with Madhouse with, 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 with reaching these teens. You may not be tutoring in our local schools, which we need help with, though, or coaching young people in basketball. And you may be a man going, I don't have anything to do with the rise. <laughs> For the most part, the answer to that is yes, but there are parts you can go by the table. So we do need help. It will help your pastor. I can go home early. But here's the thing, you may not be any of those people that are going to work with any of those groups directly. But because you're educated and engaged, you may be able to lead someone and invite someone to them. We need to be more educated. We need to be more engaged. It doesn't mean you're called to everything, but get educated. And go, I don't don't know anything about foster care. I'm not called to it, but boy, I know so-and-so. I know what they do. Andrew the inviter. So to this mercy project and mercy week or or month, we're wanting to conclude it. Will you going around those tables and meeting the organizations and ministries and getting a chance just to ask questions? If nothing else, welcome them. Welcome them and make sure they know that they're welcome here at Renovation. There's all kinds of different ways we've been doing that. But a bigger question we've been doing through Mercy is which part of this broken and fallen world that when you hear about it, when you see it, when you get near it, you want to make a difference. Game changer moments when you get there, God has a chance of grabbing your heart and not letting go. And this one and only day. In my one and only life. We could spend it indifferent because of fear or non compassion. Or we could spend it inviting others to meet the difference maker. I think that's a better choice. Amen? Amen. Next week, also, I just want to put a bug in your ear. We're going to be challenging you because you're about to go to the gymnasium, those who will go hope you will we're going to be asking for some help next week about making that even a better place for us to get what we need to get to as a community amen stand with me and pray for us IGN groups there's uh, the intent is to have six different age groups sitting around a circle we know we have to massage that as we go out there we'll get that figured out and I think Allie will be out there to help you configure that Three really easy questions. Actually, all five of them are easy, but three that's kind of fun and just kind of insightful to your life, and the other two a little more about where we've been maybe uh, as as a sermon series. So anyway, if you've only been here this week, it still works. This is your first Sunday. It works. Trust us. It works. Grab a name tag on the way out, uh, if you would, especially sitting around the circles because it just helps. Anyway, let me pray for us, Lord. Send us. To be like Andrew the inviter where we're so convicted and so compelled we can't help but tell about what we've seen and heard. Let us be those people for your glory. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you.